Good morning. Welcome back to Jack's Coffee Break. My name is Jack. So today we have a couple of tutorial requests. Um, a few months back, Matrix Potato asked if I could do some tutorials on water exhibits and on walkthrough exhibits. Well, the water exhibits is up. Um, I've done all three parts at this point for making this habitat. Um, there are a couple more topics that I want to tackle with it. Uh, specifically, I want to I want to talk about hot springs, um, and I want to talk about where you would want to use the different like colors of water and that is actually a little bit more complicated than you would think just because we got to talk about geography. Today we're going to be focusing on the walkthrough exhibits and I had been tossing back and forth how I wanted to do this for a, a while. However, Lorelion in a more recent video actually on one of the, the water tutorials has asked if I could just share my tips on like how I think about doing buildings and, and you know, ways to make things aesthetically pleasing. And so I figured that today I would combine the two into the same topic because quite frankly, it's it's the problem that I've been having myself with trying to figure out how I want to do this walkthrough exhibit tutorial. There's no reason really for us to go into the full details about everything that's on these pages, right? For the most part, there's really only three you're going to use. It's it's going to be the first main page that tells you an overview. It's going to be your climate to make sure that your animals are living in the correct temperatures. Um, and it's going to be your management tab, which is where you're going to tell it manage populations, send things to the trade center, things like that. Now, I have already covered this previously, and if that was not to your liking, other people have covered this topic to death, so there is not a shortage of information about how that mechanic works. So I'm not going to focus on it. Today, instead, I'm going to talk about how on earth you decorate for these things, because it's kind of tricky, right? It's an extremely large building. In fact, it's, it's one of the largest buildings we have in the game. As far as I know, the only thing that rivals it is going to be the large quarantine. Um, so let me pull one of those out so you can get a reference. Is it the large quarantine? Yeah, I think it is. Um, so the, the next largest building that we have is the large quarantine, um, which is a large building you know it's if we go over to our construction tab i like to measure based on these four by four walls um so the large quarantine is a three by three structure it's it's big <laughs> it's very big yeah um it was the largest building that we had and then this thing came along it is a four no five it is a five by three by two structure so this is the largest unit that we have in the entire construction tab. And it makes it difficult because the animals are going to use this entire space. Um, so I have all five of the animals that can currently go into exhibits as of my recording this in March 2024. Um, I believe we're slated for one more pack, which might add one more animal, maybe. Anything beyond that and you're talking about mods. So this is one of the bats. Um, we currently have two bats in game. Uh, the fruit bat and the Egyptian... No, it's the it's the Egyptian fruit bat and the uh, flying fox. Um, now in this one we have sloths, uh, which are our only mammal that goes in these. We also have butterflies and there's there's one other that goes in here. But I can't think of it right now. The, the list is very short, and they're all locked behind DLCs. If you don't have DLCs, you're not dealing with this situation. Um, you have access to this unit, but you don't have access to animals that can go into it. It's one of the few oversights, um, unfortunately, that I think Frontier made. But the main thing to note here is that unless you're dealing with something like the Sloth, where they're going to be limited to all of this climbing frame through here, Anything above this climbing frame, they're they're really not going to deal with. They don't climb the walls, usually. The bats and the butterflies, however, will use this space to their maximum, as you can see with them, you know, hanging on this sort of hanging mesh net. So we need to count this entire building as traversable area, and therefore we need a way to decorate this entire space. Now, most people, when they think of things like fruit bats, um or any bat, they immediately go to nocturnal habitat, which is a great idea. There are a lot of fun to build. Um, and in a lot of ways, this structure that I'm building right here is one of those. Um, 
Now I do have sloths in it, which is a little bit inappropriate. I meant to have bats in here. Um, but if we look around this space, we can see that it's enormous. It's not decorated. Um, and I haven't done much with it. I've basically just created a shell and I've added this water wheel. Um, and I've specifically used the one that moves. Um, there are ways to make this feel a little bit more realistic. One of them is uh, actually to go into your construction tab and use these special effects. Um, and if you go down to the water ones, if I can clear my filters, there we go. So you have all of these different effects. Um, and I find that the, the water jet splash can be pretty good just for adding a little bit of, uh, can I get a line of water? Thank you. Just to add a little bit of like life to it. And then to have, um, there's another water jet. Um, this one, Water Jet Medium. So if you angle this down, um, unlike what I've done, you can get this kind of effect of, um, depending on how you layer it, water like falling over this water wheel. It's a little bit frustrating to do, but it is possible. To give an example of what that looks like, I'm just going to come over here. Uh, I'm going to go into my blueprints. Here we are. Nope, that's Water Tower. This is the one I want. So here is my attempt at a water wheel. So this is an, an internal structure uh, that I've ripped out of another building just for the sake of, of transportation. Um, but you can see how I've used these chutes in order to, to use these sort of jet effects um, in order to create this water splash. So if we were to set this in this river, for example, I would just come over here. I'd set these into the water just as such. And then I would use um, the jet splash effects in order to make this look like water was actually falling this direction. So this is an example of what I like to call fake engineering, which is a lot of what we do in Planet Zoo. It's, it, unless you have enough knowledge of architecture and engineering to be able to make something realistic, and you can find the parts to do it with, a lot of what we do in Planet Zoo is basically fake engineering. We're building something that is convincing enough to life that you can pretend that it's believable, right? Good example of it is over here with this exhibit that we just finished up. So this glass that I'm using is paper thin. It is quite literally paper thin. It cannot possibly hold the amount of water that we are asking it to do. It will shatter, it will rupture. The sheer amount of pressure would see these as weak points. It would expand and bow these outward. They would crack and this entire thing would drain out. Um, you would need to use something more along the lines of our thick grade glass, something like this. And even then, depending on the amount of water volume that you're holding, this might be too thin. <laughs> water pressure is no joke. But we pretend that this is good enough because it's aesthetically pleasing, right? It fits the bill of what we want to convey. And so a lot of what we are doing in this game is not actual or literal. It is a storytelling tool. And I think that that is perhaps the most important thing I can say as far as trying to figure out what you're going to build and how you want to make something aesthetically pleasing. What story do you want to tell with your zoo? Tell that story. So. Before we get into examples of that, let's talk about where our storytelling desire meets our basically hard requirements, our hard limitations. So with all of these exhibits, they come in different modes for how you can set them up. Um, some of them have different, uh, if we go here to layout, actually no, it's a customization. So this is another tab that you'll probably want to use. It's, it's our fourth and final. You really only need to set it up at once. So there are a number of different facades that you can use around this structure. So for example, for the slots, you have wire mesh, solid, none. Um, and if you want to set this up very quickly where everything is synchronized, you can use the sink wall and ceiling material. And if I want this to be, say, none, it will automatically synchronize everything, and then I just need to figure out what I want to do with my doors and floor. Nice and simple, um, prevents you from having to go through like 14 different tabs. It's, it's not, it's like five, but it's still too many. Um, over here with the flying fox, on the other hand, we have glass, which was not an option that we had. So wire mesh glass, solid, and none. 
So this gives us different potential looks. They're not shared across everything, but the ones that are, are this solid right here and this none right here. So this is where I've turned everything off except for the pathing. And if you wanted to, you can actually quote unquote turn pathing off. You can use invisible paths. Um, the way you would do that is you would use your natural path and you would turn off your, uh, your slope or, uh, come on brain, think, think. Curb on, brown, on ground path, this button right here, turn this off. You now have an invisible path. Everything about this structure is invisible. It's great for creating natural walkways. The other thing that we need to consider is the enrichment for these animals, because there are certain stock items that are always going to come with these, right? So, for example, if we go here into customize, or, uh, no, into layout. So I have ripe fruit set up. Um, if I turn everything off, you can start to see what our base looks like. So it always is going to have these little houses right here for our butterflies, and it's always going to have these two bushes. These are hard built into the enclosure and you cannot remove them. Everything after that is decoration. So if we were to turn everything on, which doesn't negatively impact the animal, you technically only need one out of each of these categories to hit their layout requirement. But you can see that this is what this is gonna look like. You can't move these plants around. You need to build around them. So it can be nice, for example, to go into here and to figure out where all of your different hard structures are and to change them to the theme that you want. That's one example. Um, another one is to go into your nature tab and because you can place all the greenery and all the rocks you want into here, um, we could, for example, use this rock, um, assuming that it doesn't align to surface and break everything, to create a little platform for these to sit on and it would hide this, uh, this mesh plate that we're using. That's another way that we can do things. So your nature tab is fully usable in this form. You know, if you want African daisies on the ground, your guests will walk through them. They don't care, um, but it can add a nice little splash of color. Um, color matching is another thing that's limited in Planet Zoo, but not as limited as you think. So this gets into a whole argument about color theory and ugh, complementary colors versus clashing colors. And frankly, if you want to go down that rabbit hole, welcome to Art Tube. I'm good luck. Good luck. <laughs> it it can be very helpful. It can also be a dystopian nightmare. Um, but I guess most of the internet's like that, isn't it? But for example, you know, we're using all of these different flowers through here, and because we've already got this one right here, which I think is a milkweed, um, and then we're using these African daisies, and then we've got this lilac bush over here. Basically, we already have a theme of purple running through here. Um, with these little nectar um, so, uh, pans through here, and then the fruit that we're gonna have, we're already gonna have yellow. Um, so for example, if we wanted to get out some yellow plants, let me see if I can find some of those. Here we go. So here's some common yellow foxglove. And these actually do look a little bit like, um, they can be analogous to like honeysuckle, um, if you're familiar with like kind of the Eastern half of the US, that's a very popular plant and a very popular smell. And, and butterflies do like that plant. So you can use these to kind of analogize. Um, if I remember correctly, foxglove can can be toxic to wildlife so if you're looking for like ultra realism you either need to say that these are something different and label them as such or um you need to be careful about which toxic plants you're using but that's that's a choice that you're making a, a limitation for yourself you know but so we can add different plants based on the colors that um the area that we have is using we can add plants based on you know what we would like for this area to be and so this sort of brings us to how do we frame these units? So once again, we've already talked about what this is gonna look like. So here is our basic format, right? So we have a five, I'm hoping this is five, no, it's four. So we're going to have a five long by two wide by, mm, five long by three wide by two high structure. And how, much you encase it is going to impact the style of the building. For example, for something like a butterfly garden, I probably wouldn't encase it at all, um, or I would 
use something like this kind of wall setup. So if we go ahead and uh, let's just go ahead, I'm gonna say not construction, not facilities and exhibits, good. We're just gonna get rid of the nature. So we're starting with a clean habitat, quote unquote. Let's go ahead and highlight this. We'll go into construction and let's go ahead and get out some walls. Say for example that you wanted a classic butterfly garden. Well, you might wanna go for the, the classic tab. I wouldn't necessarily use brick, although you could, you absolutely could. Especially if you were going to line this up to a house, that might be something really cool. Sort of a, an old fashioned Eastern American colonial style or a British style, um, maybe a French style. Those things would absolutely make great use out of this brick. So I would probably go down to something like the limestone, however. So I'm gonna pull out my walls specifically and I'd go down to like this limestone. Um, and I would use this to line out my garden. And even though I'm following almost exactly with where this space is, you don't actually need to. You can you can bring it one more out, for example. Um, say that this is the entirety of the butterfly garden. Let's go ahead and clean this up a little bit. Oh, don't don't select that. Yeah. So we could say that this is this is the actual quote unquote space of the butterfly garden. Decorate back here. And this gives you a little bit more space to use some of your, your denser items. So for example, like um, your, your large azaleas might be nice as sort of a, a forward facing item here. Um, if you have sort of larger bushes, which you can come into here uh, at the bottom of your filters, there's a foliage type. Um, we're gonna go ahead and select bushes. Um, and these hawthorn bushes are nice and dense, right? So we could add these hawthorn bushes and they're not going to interfere with our butterfly's path um, but they add just a, a nice little breaker and then we can fill this in with like hydrangeas for example um, which are enormous we could use like roses all of these different like nice smelling plants that would attract butterflies you know so that's kind of another way you can do it instead of building uh your foliage out negatively based on its toxic properties or lack thereof um you can build it on their positive properties especially with butterflies of what plants would attract butterflies you know so that's another option and by building out sort of a little bit extra it allows us to build this nice dense wall without interrupting where the butterflies are are naturally going to exist of course, you don't even need to build this in a block. You can build a circle. You can build a blob. Um, if you're really into like modern architecture, a blob style garden would totally fit. It will take a long time. And I recommend the use of the circle tool, which if you have not familiarized with the with a way to make your make circles in Planet Zoo, um, I'm actually gonna redirect you to Rudy Rankimal. Um, his tutorial about mud pillars is the one that I use and, and Leaf might have one as well. Both of those are excellent. So there are different ways to like build out your butterfly garden. However, let's say that you did want an enclosed butterfly garden. We can, for example, go back into the construction tab and, and I'm gonna erase all of this now. Let's go ahead and erase construction as well. And for example, we could use um, glass and there are actually just the mesh pieces, not in walls, let me back out. Um, so there are different mesh pieces like these. And then there is another one that I'm thinking of. Let me, let me try and find it. Uh, yeah, so these walk through exhibit nettings. Here we go. So these can also be really nice if you want a good amount of airflow but you want a little bit more flexibility. These are off-grid pieces. Um, and then we also have access to just straight up this PVC pipe curtain, uh, which will come in handy for another thing that I'm gonna show you in a little bit. You also have access to these hanging flower baskets in this chain. Um, that could be really nice if you wanted to give this thing a ceiling. So for example, um, I'm just gonna grab some glass real quick. So you can use this sort of, uh, thicker beamed glass house style um, from the classic section, or you can use this modern glass wall, um, and that's gonna be from the new world section. Or of course, if you're if you're feeling really artsy, um, there are these large glass panels or glass 
yeah, glass panels um, that are completely see-through. So you can build out large stretches of just glass without any kind of interruption. But for example, you know, if you wanted to build out more of a glass house style, you know, you absolutely could using the tools that we have just so long as you, you know, match up everything and make it sort of a, a reasonable space. And then where things get exciting is when you go into roofing. So for example, we have these six meter arches that you could use um, to make it nice and tall. This would actually get you over the height requirement for uh, this unit over here. And then of course these um, classics are flexi colors. So for example, if we want to match our colors over here, we can use these glass frames. Unfortunately, there is not an inverse curve, which is disappointing to say the least. So you're gonna have a little bit of a, a difficult time finding a way to roof this area right right through here. But, you know, with with careful careful thought for, uh, for planning and a little bit of geometry, I think you can do it. I think it's possible. Um, you're just gonna have to use these small glass pieces in certain places and be okay with some overlap. Um, for example, you could probably use this inverted corner as a frame out. Um, well, maybe not, maybe not. It'll, it's going to be difficult, um, is what I'm saying, but you can make it work. Or you can do just a more traditional glass house. All of these things would work. If you're looking for realism, the most important thing that you remember is how are your butterflies getting airflow? Um, more than just needing air to breathe, which butterflies don't actually use a lot of air. You're going to need it so that way they actually have airflow for them to flap with. Um, they will generate some amount of current through their wings. You, you know this through like chaos memes, I'm sure. Um, but for all of our flying creatures, they need some amount of airflow to actually give them momentum so that way they can begin the process of flying. So that's another thing that you can consider um, is sort of these realistic details. Um, but I think I've said as much as I can on this map, I'm going to swap over to a couple of examples now. Okay, so here we are in one of my franchise zoos. Um, I have too many of them. <laughs> So for this one, I had a, a very particular style I was going for for this area. Uh, don't worry about the pyramid. And I really have not done a whole lot of decorating with this zoo. I've, I've started a little bit, but for the most part, you can tell. I've used almost entirely the plaster pieces, and I've used a little bit of color in order to give it that pop, but there's no decorating to be found here. Instead, I've been focusing my decorating on things like the habitats, and um, what we're specifically going to be looking at today is going to be this bat habitat that I've made. So looking around in here, um, and I'm going to go ahead and hit play so that way hopefully you can see some of the bats. Yeah, there we go. Um, and I've been very careful about where I put my walls, uh, especially my rock wall, to make sure that the bats don't clip into anything. Um, they will probably clip into a lot of these stalactites based on like <laughs> just where they are. If you want to avoid that, you can follow the path trajectories of these guys, um, usually from above, and figure out where the holes are and then place your stalactites there. It feels like a lot of effort to me, so I didn't do that. Um, instead, what I've used is the twilight pack and then uh, just some base stone, which you can use any stone you want because these twilight stalagmites and stalactites are recolorable. And I've built out this sort of stony floor. Um, I've made sure to vary the different heights of, of both pieces, and I try not to use the entirety of the piece unless I want something that really extrudes, like this chunk right here. So this way I can get sort of this cave walkthrough entrance. And because I want it to be a night habitat, I've done something a little bit different with my walls. So I'm using the template that is completely like clear and open. Um, for my exhibit. And then these walls that you can see through here, I'm actually using one-way glass. The difference is that I faced the clear side into this building in order to advertise it. And I faced the dark portion so that way when the, when the guests look out through here, they can kind of see the park, but not really. Um, and it, it helps to create this sort of dark environment. Same with the painting of the walls uh, black. It just helps to create more of this night house kind of feel. Now, can I push this farther? Absolutely. Um, I'm not really inclined to, especially right now at the moment, um, but 
you know, there are ways that I can continue to improve this. For example, you know, I can I can create little cliffs through here and sort of make terra uh, like like terrarium or, or vivarium sort of fall stone uh, little cutouts. I can have water that maybe drips from some of these. I could incorporate gemstones, all kinds of things that I could do. On the outside, I've done this little bit of gardening through here. I've been using uh, these stone pieces. So this is a whole bunch of faux stones that I've just sort of slapped together in a row and then have been using to decorate as curbs. But in order to make this building work, you'll notice that it's way taller than it should be. And this is to cover the fact that these stalactites are going to clip through the ceiling. Um, and because I don't want this to interrupt their flying space, I have to make the building taller in, in order to make this facade work without it clipping through the top. We are also using our mixed usage building template. So the back half of this is a walkthrough exhibit and the front half of this is um, a very jammed <laughs> concession area. So this way I'm utilizing more of my physical land space than I would by separating these two buildings out. So that's one example of how I might use these. Um, I'm gonna pop over to another one now. So here we are in my randomizer zoo. Um, so this one, again, I've relied mostly on the build parts in order to provide detail, but then I've gone through and I've actually added some details. It's a little bit more fleshed out than the other one was. For example, I've used boat parts in order to kind of enclose this area in kind of an old shipwreck. I've used a lot of the Twilight pieces. Twilight Pack is one of my favorites. Um, I know it's not a fan favorite, but it's mine. In order to try and add more turrets to these. And of course I can push the, the building style of this even further. Um, but one of the main places where I focused my detailing efforts has been on these walls. So what I've done is I've created a sort of a, a pack for myself of all of these different pieces that I know that I'm going to be using all the time. So here's one of these. Um, it's sort of a, a nice thick double glass layer. And I've used a lot of the walls, the turrets, the crenellations, and I, I'm really pushing myself to use the Twilight Pack to its maximum. Um, here is an example of where I haven't really done that, uh, but I have been doing something a little bit different with this. So this is another walkthrough exhibit. Doesn't look like it. Looks like a castle on the outside, and that is on purpose. So this is what I'm saying when, I, when I'm talking about the fact that, you know, you can sort of push how the exhibits function and that you don't need to line it up with the walls exactly. There's, there's really no reason to do that. So this is a dual habitat. Um, despite the fact that it is a walkthrough exhibit, it is also a regular habitat. Um, so in here I have kiwis and this is going to be a place for them to walk through. Um, but then also when I because this is a randomizer, I'm having to wait for one of my um, exhibit animals to pop up. Um, so this should, yes, this does have a walkthrough exhibit. So you can see that I've I've got it with nothing showing. Um, so let me go ahead and just show you where this would be. So now you can see sort of the outline of where my walkthrough exhibit is. I'm going to go ahead and turn this back to none so that way we can get a good look at the habitat. So when I finally roll on something like bats um, or sloths or, or whatever, because we're in a tundra zoo, it makes more sense for them to be in an enclosed space. Now this would still be too cold. I do have heaters, um, but the goal is to try and make this warm enough for kiwis and whatever walkthrough exhibit animal we end up rolling someday. So I've decorated this sort of sparsely and there's really nothing to look at in here. And that is by design. Um, again, I'm waiting on that extra animal, but you can see where I've pushed this. So this is meeting the land requirements for our kiwis by quite a lot. Um, and by making use of the uh, guest gates, which I'm not gonna put this down, um, but by making use of the guest gates, I can keep the, this whole walkthrough space enclosed, which keeps my kiwis inside. And then I have this little entrance over here that leads to my staff area that I've decorated ever so slightly. Um, so that way you can actually see how like the staff would enter into this into this habitat and it fully functions. So if I can, there we go, here's my barriers. So I've wrapped a barrier around this entire space and then I've put an exhibit in the center of it 
And as I get more ideas, as I know what animals I want to do, which I'm, as you can see from the side here, I'm really hoping for bats. <laughs> But as I get more ideas, I'm slowly building this up. Um, the next thing is going to be to add these little, um, I think they're called matriculations, to the sides um, to make it more cohesive with the rest of the buildings in this space. Do a little bit of outlining. Um, and then I've, I've used these sort of turrets and uh, these sort of overhangs in order to give it just a little bit of style. And they're acting as build notes for me. So I know, okay, this is how I want this thing to be styled out. This is how I want to keep the theme moving forward. Um, and it's how I'm managing to keep a cohesive theme across months and months of ideas is to basically tell myself, hey, this is an idea, make sure you use this elsewhere. So for example, this weird little whatever is happening here is something that I might want to use uh, when we get to other parts of the zoo. So that is basically another idea. So the last build that I'm going to show off for today is this one here in what, what I've dubbed Hyacinth Park. Um, if you watch some of my earlier tutorials, um, especially the ones about like, um, basically anything where these feature, so multi-layer buildings, multi-purpose buildings, um, how to get started with building, building mechanics, this park is going to feel familiar to you. And you've probably already seen me show off bits and pieces of this. Um, so this is my night house. It is enormous. And essentially what I've done here is I've given myself a massive footprint. Um, compared to the rest of the park, it takes up most of the park. Like, <laughs> it's huge. And what I've wanted to do here is basically give myself kind of a stadium or, or warehouse style building in order to flesh out. So there is a certain size of building where by the time that you get done building the shell, you basically have an entire park inside. Um, and you can, like the, the limitation is gonna be the fact that you have a ceiling. Um, you have an enormous amount of space. So in here, as you walk in is going to be our bats. So we have both species of bat in here. And you'll notice that everything is lined in bamboo. This is not an option available in the exhibit I have meticulously gone through and lined all of these pieces in bamboo. <laughs> but we have the bamboo parts to do it, clearly. And this is just to tie it in with the overall Oceania theme that I want to go through with this. So it doesn't interrupt anything. Um, we have these little tiki torches, which um, realistically would be a hazard to the animal. I don't like to build too realistically. I'm again, I like to tell a story. I like to focus on style. I want to build places that would be cool to visit, whether they could exist in real life or not. And so part of that is I've started to build up this this rock wall facade through here. Um, and then over here, I've added in this waterfall. So this um, exhibit through here, it kind of clips into the the no, it doesn't. It, it can clip into the flying space, but it doesn't very much. Um, and what I've done is I've added this little fake river. Um, and I've just do, done this with the terrace tool. And then I've, I'm starting to line it out with like rocks. Um, flat ones and pebbles has been the great combination. And then using my waterfall pieces from the aquatic pack in order to build this false waterfall. And it gives it this very nice, humid, tropical feel in combination with the plants that I've added in. And then I've added this sort of wall that sort of separates these two places. So you understand that these are two different habitats, but they flow together as if they are one cohesive unit. Um, so that's sort of where I've, I've used structure to indicate. The lower your walls are, the more open something feels and the more connected it feels while giving that sense of separation. The higher the walls, the greater the sense of separation. You have no idea what's through here besides the fact that you can see two staircases. This is what is through here. So I'm using um, Twilight Walls and Oceania and um, some of our, it's not the Southeast Asia pack, but it's the build pack version of it. Um, and I'm using these roots in order to, to start to build out sort of a root wall. I've got these little garden planters and these are to disrupt walking space. So I've gone through this entire thing. Um, at least I'm pretty sure that I did. and just using my gridded construction pieces, I've 
made all of this walkable with paths. I've then used these planters in order to break up that walking space. And if you want to enforce this, you can use the barrier items. Um, in the facilities tab, they're going to be in security. And they're, they're these pieces right here. So um, these curbs and guest barrier ribbons are really what I suggest. And they, they basically block off guests from being able to access an area. I've once again continued this waterfall effect. And I've, I've got it leading into some grass. And, and basically, there, there'd be a filter down here, so it's, it's not flooding. And this is sort of a theme that I've carried out throughout this entire first floor, is to make sure that I'm disrupting certain areas and highlighting things like the walking path. So this is LED. So if we go ahead and turn this to night, you can see how this path would glow. And this would partially be security lighting, you know, for, for your security staff, your janitorial staff, etc. Um, but also, if you wanted to have true night walkthrough tours, this would be another way to tell your guests, hey, this is the area you're supposed to stay in. So as I continue to build this, I'm going to continue using these LEDs as sort of a path highlight. I've also got this massive glass wall through here, so this will be how guests can kind of look out onto the park and how other park patrons can look into here. Oftentimes, if you don't know what a building is, especially in a zoo, it can feel like you're not supposed to go there or be there. If you can see the building clearly and you can kind of get a hint of what's inside of it, it creates a sense of intrigue, and so it, it draws people to that area of the park that would otherwise, you know, sort of feel like a you're not supposed to be here situation. Um, of course, you can also get around this by advertising and, um, you know, having different signs and, and also through your path design, just naturally have the largest path lead to the largest building. Um, and that will create a sense of high traffic. So through here, um, this is my otter habitat, I think. I think that's otters. Um, let me go double check. Um, no, this is platypi. So... Here is one of my tiny little platypi. Um, he's a baby. So we have some adults in here as well. They've been breeding. And this slope goes down into this secondary area. So you get your underwater viewing by staying on the ground floor. And I've made sure to decorate the underwater area. So this is going to increase the amount of foliage that you use in your habitat, but it is really, really worth it. Um, for these, um, this is a group uh, made up in individually of underwater temple plants, and it creates a kind of kelp. Um, this is something that we go over in the underwater viewing areas video, um, especially the third one. Not a lot of talking in that one, but you can see pretty clearly what my goal is. Up here, we've mostly decorated with, with grass and, and sedges and things like that in order to give it the sort of desert tropical feeling. Um, let's go ahead and turn the lights back on again. A little bit of bloom there. And so now we can see it clearly. Um, now this is not as decorated as I would like. I'm trying very hard, um, and I do just in general with most of my buildings, to respect coverage to a certain threshold. Here you can see that I clearly have not. Um, but with a lot of my animals, I try and respect their, their coverage requirements. If you decide not to, it only takes like 3% off their welfare. So as long as the rest of your keeping is fine, you can decorate these as much as you like. Over here, I have my kiwis. Um, so this is actually based off of something that I saw when I was in New Zealand. This is a little bit larger. It, in, in the one that I saw, they had these small little circles and sort of dens and ways for the kiwis to, to jump back and forth and then go into their, their private areas. And I've, I've tried to replicate that just a little bit here, but make it larger and more appealing. So again, making use of a lot of rocks, a lot of sedges. And then back through here, I have this little door, and we have a larger one over here. And I'm using kind of a black plaster illusion, essentially, to create a sense that this door doesn't exist. And then using foliage to, to try and block it off. And this is going to be their backstage area, which is where you can see they're resting right now. So while these are not exhibit animals, um, you their building methods are, are kind of like the, the walkthrough exhibits in the sense that they're they're smaller than usual areas. Um, the platypi, not so much. But definitely the kiwis and the, the platypi can be kept in very small areas. 
And then of course, you know, you can, as I, as I showed previously, combine habitats with your walkthrough exhibits, and it's not going to cause any kind of disruption. Um, your habitat animals don't recognize exhibit animals as, as being animals, as being entities. So you can combine these quite nicely. So this is basically the idea behind this entire night house. They are separate, but I, I'm trying my best to like keep this all kind of cohesive and create an experience as you walk through. And the last thing that I've done, and this is specifically something for Planet Zoo, is that I keep these doors open. It's not realistic. You would want these doors to be closed, but I use this in case, you know, I decide to ever upload this to the um, workshop. So that way people who download my park can see, hey, this door is open and it invites you in. Um, it's sort of a, more of a video game mechanic, uh, a, kind of one of those illusion tricks that we use in, in video game design. I say we, um, I've barely designed anything. I've tried, I have worked on it. Um, I do study it, <laughs> but you know, it's, it's basically one of those uh, psychological tricks to tell people, hey, this is a space for you to come into. I made this deck and then of course, you know, you leave this way. So this is what the building looks like. But of course, if you're going to have a building this large, you're also going to need to have staff areas. So this is a temporary space, but of course, if we came through here, um, this is going to be where our staff basically do all their business. Um, here you can see my power facility, it's starting to break down. And then this hallway up through here is what leads you into the Kiwi access area. Going back down here, you may have seen this little door. Um, so I would probably put a sign here or a closed door, something to indicate that this is a staff facility, right? So we do have a little bit of structure clipping, but thankfully the, the staff in this game don't care. And this is what leads you over here in order to be able to access um, the platypi habitat. So all of this decorating, I'm, I'm doing this slowly, I'm doing it over time, and I'm doing it as ideas come to me. Um, and that's really something that I've, I've learned to embrace, um, especially with a game as large and as detailed as Planet Zoo, is to just take things slow. Um, ideas will come, and if you run out of ideas, it's okay to stop and walk away and do something completely different and come back. So that is kind of the rough overall idea of what I use for exhibit building and um, sort of a, a primer in how I start to build areas um, and how I start to add appeal and things like that. And I will, I will give a, a more detailed walk through on exactly like what is my logic process? How am I finding places of appeal? What kind of research am I doing um, in order to create things that are like this, you know, not so much this, <laughs> this was sort of a, a happenstance. I just, I needed to throw down something and this is sort of what came out. Um, but again, we'll, we'll talk about all of that probably in the next tutorial to, to give it more air. Um, because again, I'm, I'm trying to focus as much on walkthrough exhibits with this reference as I can. But anyway, that's basically all and a little bit more than I really have to say. So thank you very much for joining me. I hope you have a great day. Uh, stay safe and of course, happy building.